It's the Dearly Departed Podcast, featuring your host, historian Scott Michaels, and filmmaker Mike Dorsey. Here we are, episode 20 of the Dearly Departed Podcast. Can you believe it's been 20 shows already? And it seems like just yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, um, so we are going to do uh, James Bond. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, there is a, there is a lot of information. Uh, when we started doing the research for James Bond, uh, it was just a wormhole that you know yeah. it got to be uh, the different Bonds. Although there's only really one dead, uh, the mm-hmm. but the rest of them it became the villains, it became the girls, and the girls are some of the girls are villains and some of the monics. So you call you know Grace Jones a Bond girl, you really can't because she was not a love interest. I don't know. It's confusing. So what, what Mike and I did was choose who we thought were most interesting. So this is by no <laughs> means a, uh, a encyclopedic, you know, uh, rundown of every Bond and every movie and every person, but the people we thought sort of like the greatest hits, the most interesting of the stories. Right. Exactly. So this will be fun. Uh, James Bond is a personal favorite of mine growing up. Uh, who is your favorite James Bond? Roger Moore. Here's your right. Me too. Isn't yeah. that funny? Most people will say John, Sean Connery, but that's kind of funny. We're both Roger Moore fans. See, he was the Bond I grew up with, though. He was the one, you know, the, Sean exactly. Connery, he was, yeah, he was the first few movies, uh, but Roger Moore took over and, and uh, he, yeah, he was the one I grew up with. So when I saw kids, you know, Saturday matinees, it was him first. I, I like Sean Connery, but right. uh, but to me, I, I don't know, more of a fair haired Bond for some reason that I like that more. So, uh, and uh, it's interesting because I was looking at a couple of the uh, the different choices uh, for the different Bonds over the, you know, Ian Fleming supposedly wanted David Niven originally. But did you see, uh, I, I was something popped up the other day. They do one of those deep fake things, you know, where they, they computer generate other mm-hmm. faces on actors. And they, they did a Burt Reynolds, Sean Connery James Bond one, and it, wow. it's so it's so good and it's so scary because you realize you just don't need actors anymore. You know, it's <laughs> it's what's so sad about. I mean, if they can resurrect Burt Reynolds like they're talking about doing James Dean now for whatever mm-hmm. you know they're going to. It's frightening because these people died and they don't have any say so what's going on with their careers. You know, it right. was like when Fred Astaire was selling. Or uh, was it Fred Astaire selling vacuum cleaners or something? Something like uh, that. You yeah. know, yeah, and and it was just I, I find that so. I like seeing him again. However, mm-hmm. it's just so, I think it's almost like grave robbing in a weird way. And Yeah, there's uh, an ethical question around it for sure because yeah. they're not there to say, oh, that's how I would have done that. Yes. And that's why I had a problem with Natalie Cole, you know, doing the duets with her father. It's like mm-hmm. her father, you know, didn't say yes to that. Right. Uh, and Natalie Cole basically, you know, I like the music. I'm not going to mm-hmm. say I don't. But it, to me, it's it's crossed the line a bit of, of uh, you know, permissions right. and, and rights. But uh Hey, whatever, man. It's the family's wishes. They, whoever has the rights to these images, they're probably getting a lot of money for this stuff. Speaking of the family's wishes, uh, did I, I did I tell you that I came across a weird? Oh, I think I sent you the chapter. I was reading Dean Torrance's book, uh, Dean Torrance of. Jan and Dean, the surf mm-hmm, rock mm-hmm, duo of the mm-hmm. 60s. Uh, he has a book called Surf City, the Jan and Dean story, um, which is like an autobiography, basically. And uh, if you can believe it, Dean Torrance of Jan and Dean had a Manson story. Mm-hmm. I know you sent it to me, but I didn't get a chance to read it. So I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'll tell yeah, it to you. I'll okay, tell please you. do. It's hilarious. Well, I, well, it's weird. He never actually, I don't think, ever met the Mansons, but he was connected to them through the Beach Boys. Because mm-hmm. they were all friends. And mm-hmm. Brian Wilson wrote Jan and Dean songs. Uh, Brian Wilson co-wrote uh, uh, Dead Man's Curve for Jan and Dean and some other songs. And, um, and Dean was also friends with Dennis Wilson. And so he knew of this like hippie dude coming around wanting to be a rock star. And that Dennis Wilson was trying to help him out and was trying to get Terry Melcher involved. And Terry Melcher also knew Dean. And so I guess what happened was after the Mansons you know, were kicked out of Dennis Wilson's house and moved to Spawn Ranch... Dennis Wilson, you know, was still going out there to visit them, and he was trying to get Terry Melcher to go out and hear Manson perform. And this is when Dean gets involved. So Dean Torrance claims that um, he was good friends with this very successful session guitarist who had made a a mobile recording studio out of an Airstream trailer. Mm -hmm. And so Terry Melcher calls Dean up one day and says, hey, man, I'm supposed to go out to this, you know, this 
movie ranch out in the middle of nowhere to some hippie commune, and I really don't want to. Uh, I'd rather just have send someone out to record these guys, and then I'll just listen to the recording. Do you know anybody that could go do that? And Dean's like, oh, yeah, I have a good friend of mine just built a mobile recording studio. He'll do it. So anyway, so this guy agreed to do it, and he went out, and he came back, and, and Dean was supposed to go with him out to Spawn Ranch that weekend. And then Dean was dating some girl that, that lived in Malibu, and she invited him out for the weekend, and he just totally forgot about this whole hippie thing and went and spent the weekend with her and then remembered you know, the next Monday, like, oh, crap, I was supposed to go do that. So he checks in with this guy, and this guy's like, oh, man, it was so amazing. There are all these girls around, and we had, like, an orgy, and we just, like, hung out. And Dean was like, okay, well, how'd the recording come out? And he's like, oh, we didn't really get to that. <laughs> So he's like, I'm supposed to go out again next weekend and actually do the recording. And so he goes out the next weekend. And again, Dean kind of stood the guy up and, and got distracted and didn't go with him. And he said that he checked in with the guy afterwards and the guy didn't want to talk about it. The second trip. He's like, I don't want to talk about it. And so Dean called a mutual friend of theirs. And the friend said, oh, yeah, Manson got really mad at him and held a pitchfork to his throat and threatened mm-hmm. to kill him. And the girls had to intervene to keep Charlie from doing it. And so he'll never he'll never go out there and work with those deal with those people again. And then, you know, a few months later is when the murders happened. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. and so anyways, I thought it was interesting that the clean cut Jan and Dean even had connections in some weird way to the to the Manson story. It Um, is weird. But that Surf City, the Jan and Dean story is a pretty good book. It's on Amazon. I recommend it. Cool. Yeah, they I mean, it's. A couple of songs that Jan and Dean did, I was sort of surprised that it wasn't the Beach Boys, you know? Right. Because uh, it was sounded, I, that's why, I, I, and it sounds, you know, I don't, I didn't know that uh, <laughs> Brian Wilson co-wrote uh, Dead Man's Curve. I, I didn't know that. Yep. Um, they wrote it at uh, Brian Wilson's mom's house in Santa Monica. Audrey, the mother. She's buried at, at Westwood in a, the original Surfer Girl, it says on her grave. Oh, how nice. That's yeah. awesome. But uh, well, it's very, it's, it's fascinating that stuff. How 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 far reaching it all is. It's I mean, obviously, we right. know how you know and how fascinating it is to us. And, and there was one other thing I wanted to point out. You know, we talked. We, our last show was on different strokes, mm-hmm. and we also mentioned The Exorcist. And what we mm-hmm. didn't mention was Dana Plato was originally cast as the lead in The Exorcist. I didn't she know that. She was supposed to Wait play the second. role that Linda Blair got. I can I double confirm this and Dana Plato ended up being in the sequel. The Exorcist wow. 2 and has <laughs> well, a scene well, how, with Linda Blair. How old was she when when The Exorcist was made? I didn't think she, she was, was only like yet. 9 or 10. So she was four, like 4 years younger than Linda Blair, which is interesting because Linda Blair was like 13, 14, I think, uh, huh. when she made that. So it would have totally changed I think the character quite a bit having her that much younger. Apparently uh, Dana from what I read Dana Plato's mom was the one that said no to it that she had the part and their mom's like nope and then you know four years later they when they make the exorcist 2 dana plato had a small part in it as a a, she was like a developmentally disabled girl um Mm -hmm. and she has a scene with uh with linda blair it's kind of interesting so Hmm. and then you know a year after exorcist 2 came out different strokes happened so you know she got her break Interesting. And Max von Sido, who just died recently, was one of the Bond villains, which I think is kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, so incestuous. It all, it all comes together, these actors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before we get going, I want to I want a shout out. Uh, one of the people that listened to us, uh, his name is Charles Fritz. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but he sent me the book about the elephant, the Edison oh, elephant. Topsy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. So he just sent it to me and uh, I'm anxious to get started on it. That was the electrocuted elephant? It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And apparently there's there's several stories in here about Edison and animals, etc. So, uh, it, it were, yeah, so I'm anxious to get started. So I just want to say thanks to Charles uh, for sending this to me. I'm looking that's forward a thick, to that. That's a thick book, too. It's like a lot of stories yeah. in there. Huh. Yeah, yeah. The Startling Story of the Crooked-Tailed Elephant, P.T. Barnum, P. T. Barnum and the American Wizard, Thomas Edison. So they probably knew each other and uh, were in cahoots some level. They, they all are. Right. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, pretty interesting. So thanks, Charles. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Charles. That's cool. All right, uh, why not? Let's just do hate mail. Hate mail. 
tons of nice mail, tons and tons and tons. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it's, it's a lot of supportive uh, email. And I, I can't say I got anything necessarily negative uh, uh, regarding the podcast, but I did have a guy who wrote me and he says, you can technically file this under hate mail because I hate, uh, I hate that I end up Googling Gary Coleman's penis after listening to the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's one we of those things, it. once you put the idea in someone's head, they can't. They can't get over it. <laughs> I gotta we look. Had a nice, we had a nice note from one of our Patreon supporters, um, which is a, a plug. We are on Patreon, um, which you can uh, join for little, little as $2 a month, and you get um, advanced access to these episodes. They come out a couple, day or two ahead of time on Patreon, and we also do uh, mini episodes every month, um, which are like in between these main shows. But uh, Patreon mm -hmm. supporter Don wrote, um, we were talking about the, these death cult the members of death cults that are still around that survived and are still doing things. Uh, Don writes, just to let you know, there are still branch Davidians on the Mount Carmel property in Waco. It's the creepiest place I've ever been. You may still have the artifacts that I sent you from that property. I don't know. You oh, got yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. He said, uh, oh, the Donnie. survivors. Hi, Donnie. Yeah. He said Survi the survivors cleared the remains of the church compound that we all knew and rebuilt a small church on the property. When you pull onto the property, there are different creepy memorials for all the children, adults, and officers that died that day. Wow. Yeah, that, wow. Don, Don went there and he found all kinds of, there's like, the bus is still there. And um, that, that is fascinating. I, I went through uh, that area of Texas, but we didn't, we just didn't, didn't bother. And I don't know why to stop mm -hmm. at, uh, at Waco, but um Huh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, it, it's wild to think that those people are still around. You know, the source uh, is still around. The, the Children of God, which is that, uh, you know, the Phoenix family is involved with, they're still around. And uh, who's that guy, the guy from uh, Fleetwood Mac that uh, <laughs> that left to get a newspaper and, and joined the cult and they couldn't find him for months? Uh, <laughs> one of as, the, I mean, it do. just... As you yeah, do. right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, there's but, still, uh, there's still uh, Heaven's Gate people around, I think, the people that were left behind to keep the well, site you think running. Well, you, you think you go, you know, that didn't work out, you know? <laughs> you, missed that, you missed the comet. Uh, um, <laughs> it's going to be another thousand years before it shows up again. But uh, hey, Imagine oh, being disappointed cult. that you missed out on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, we did get one uh, critical review on iTunes. And the, the person just said um, we dropped too many names. <laughs> okay. That's what we do, though. That's yeah. the show. That's so, okay. I mean, you I know, respect, okay. I respect everyone's opinion, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Um, any more mail? Because there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of name dropping in this one, so yeah. uh, just forewarn you if you don't like this stuff, just turn off the volume but keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that all the mail? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, a ton of supportive mail, and uh, the, only, the only there's a few Gary Coleman's, but uh, but that was the best. <laughs> Shall we do deaths of the week? Sure. News of the week. <laughs> uh, I think it probably has to start with Brian Dennehy, winner yeah. of uh, winner of two Tony Awards, six Emmys, a Golden Globe. Uh, he was in Ratatouille and Tommy Boy, uh, both movies where he played the dad of the main character. Uh, he was in two of my favorites from 1985, uh, Cocoon and Silverado. One of my uh, Silverado for sure is in my like top 20. And he was in the FX movies and a bunch of others. Uh, they said he liked to, to be in movies and TV shows because it supported his stage acting career, which is where he really loved. Uh, he to, was, to uh, yeah, he was a uh, uh, very, uh, you know what, he was, I used to really like him as just a, a nice, likable uh, mm. character. But when he played Gacy, that was the one where, like, that changed it for me because he was so good at being, you know, there was a point where Gacy, you know, was a clown. Mm. And then the little kid came up to him and he just switched modes and he <laughs> became this really awful, you know, kid, get away from me kind of thing. But it was so, so scary. Um, but you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to look at, I wanted to. One thing that nobody really touched on uh, in any of the obituaries, and I'm looking it up right now just to be absolutely sure, and uh, that Dennehy, it sounds really terrible, but Dennehy falsely claimed to be a veteran. And that was a big 
deal back. Uh, I didn't know it was a false it, claim, was it? Yeah, yeah, it was because they they you know they, there was it was outrage and uh, let's see, Brian Denny he claimed for years that he served a five year tour as a Marine in Vietnam where he was wounded. In uh, in reality, Denny he's only Vietnam action was on screen in Rumor of War, which he portrayed a Marine gunnery wow. side sergeant. So he did serve in the Marines. It was not in Vietnam, and his only combat duty was playing football in Okinawa in '62. Wow. So I, that was that was scandalous back when it first happened, and and uh, you know it tarnished his career, but not a single person mentioned it uh, after he I died. Even know. Which I is, thought I just knew he was a Marine veteran. I didn't know there was a scandal around that he claimed to be yeah. combat. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I liked him outside of that. Um, and mm-hmm. I, I, he was just this big burly guy who could play a menacing bad guy, but also be really charismatic at the same time. There's not, mm-hmm. there's kind of nobody else that can do what Brian Dennehy did, right? He was one of those kinds of actors. Yeah, likable and easily not likable. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a lot. Of, yeah, people don't have that uh, that uh, arc. So he died on April fifteenth, um, cardiac arrest due to sepsis, and he was eighty one years old. And then uh, I think next up really is John Prine, the the folk singer songwriter. Um, I was not that familiar with him before he died, but I know he was very very famous and highly respected. Uh, he was a musician's musician, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a great story about how Roger Ebert l- launched his career in 1970. Uh, Ebert was supposed to be at a movie screening to review it, and he left early because the the popcorn was too salty, according to him. Mm -hmm. And so he walked over to a nearby bar just to get a beer, and there was a guy playing folk music, and it was John Prine. And uh, Ebert wrote later on, Through no wisdom of my own, but out of sheer blind luck, I walked into the fifth peg, a folk club on West Armitage Street, one night in 1970, and heard a mailman from Westchester singing. And Ebert wrote the article uh, based on that performance that launched John Prine's career. Interesting. Interesting. But yeah, likable, uh, are very re- well respected for sure. And, uh, and it's uh, a real shame that he's gone. Yeah, he was uh, covered and championed by Bonnie Raitt, Dylan, Springsteen, Mellencamp, R.E.M. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. He was a uh, contemporary of uh, Chris Christopherson. Um, and there's, there's a great uh, interview online of him with uh, Bill Murray, who I believe he was really good friends with as well. Uh, you know, Bill Murray was a fan of his going way back. So, uh, yeah, and John Prine and Brian Dennehy, both Chicago connections. Prine was from Chicago, and Dennehy was real big on the stage in Chicago. So... That's right. I saw him in Chicago. I forgot about that. He was making. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I think I remember he was a native Chicagoan. You saw uh, or, uh, John Prine yeah. or Dennehy? Dennehy. I remember seeing him uh, oh. walking down. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chicago. I mean, that sounds like I'm name dropping. But no, no, no. I remember <laughs> it was Chicago, and I and I remember seeing him walking around, and uh, while while he was doing. No, he wasn't even filming. So anyway, not that doesn't he matter. Just... I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, I saw someone. No, it was just conversationally. I didn't so, tend to do that. <laughs> so. Prine passed away on April 7th at the age of 73, and it was from the coronavirus. And it, it was sad because it was covered in the press when he went on. He was in you know intensive care, and he was on the ventilator. And it also it kind of sounded like maybe he was starting to do better, and then, and then he passed away. So mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Rest, in, rest in peace, John Prine. Uh, Mal- Malcolm Dixon, who is a British actor with dwarfism, he was four foot one, and he was uh, most famous as uh, Leek Tar, the Ewok in Return of the Jedi, and as Strutter in uh, Time Bandits, and he was in a bunch of other movies where they needed little people. So he played an Oompa Loompa in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, he appeared in the Dark Crystal Labyrinth, Willow, and he passed wow. away. <laughs> he was in a bunch of sometimes yeah. uncredited roles. They just needed you know, yeah. a, a group of little people like Oompa Loompas. Um, but yeah, he, he had a really fascinating long career, and he passed away on April 9th at 86, and no cause was given. Wow, I um my my little friend Sadie uh, from Rocky Horror, uh, she worked a lot, you know, as a little person. I think we might have talked about her before, mm-hmm. but she was she was in uh, she was played the slave master in the Dark Crystal and uh, the person in the costume, and she was an Ewok too. Uh, so it's they must have known each other. She knew Kenny Baker, so uh, mm. she must have known these guys. Who was R two D two, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Honor Blackman. 
coincidentally, since we're talking about Bond, uh, famous, probably most famous for being Pussy Galore, the Bond girl in Goldfinger, uh, which has got to be one of the best character names in history. Pussy Galore. Pussy Galore in the Goldfinger. <laughs> she... <laughs> She liked, uh, I guess she liked to uh, make people uncomfortable back then, like pseudo executives, by, you know, introducing herself as pussy galore and seeing, you know, the expression on their face. Um, and then what is it with with Bond and that name? Because there was also Octopussy, which is one of my favorite I, I don't Roger Moore ones. How they, I how it was the most bizarre thing to see that on movie marquees. And it's like. <laughs> How do you clear that with sensors? You know what I mean? They won't. It's just okay. That they let that one go. I don't. It can don't. also be a cat. I know that's what they probably said, right? I don't know. It's like, uh, weren't you saying that when in documentaries, the thing about it, you could say the word "fuck," not the, yeah, as a curse word, not as did, an action. It's yeah. all about context. So yeah. there you go. Um, she was also uh, uh, <laughs> famous as. Um, as Kathy Gale in the Avengers and as Hera and Jason in the Argonauts, both 60s series. And uh, it's funny, if you watch where she gets introduced as Pussy Galore in uh, Goldfinger, it's very, very, very similar to the introduction of Grace Kelly in Rear Window, where um, James Bond is asleep and he wakes up and we go to his POV and this is blurry image of, of, of Blackman coming in towards the screen, you know, her face coming towards the camera. So I thought that was kind of interesting that it was, mm -hmm. it was very clearly, you know, based on that. Um, but she passed away on April 5th from natural causes. She was 94 and her family was very adamant to, to make sure people knew that it wasn't coronavirus related, which is just the times we live in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the sixties, she, she released a single, uh, called kinky boots. Because she was famous for, you know, wearing these like stiletto boots, you know, mm -hmm. in the show. And uh, and it was a pop song that was really successful in Britain. And uh, and then they took that that, you know, title for the play, Kinky Boots. And oh, interesting. Uh, so it was it was Honor Blackman's uh, uh, single. And oh, wow. It's so such a weird they... song, you know, then it had a kinky boots. It's just weird. <laughs> but they, but in Britain, that's what they call them. They do call them kinky boots uh, when, huh. you know, you're the stiletto, uh, you know, like big boots yeah yeah sure. they do call them that so uh as a nickname it's kind of funny not funny it just is it's <laughs> <laughs> um and then uh something definitely not funny uh rfk uh, robert f kennedy's granddaughter mave mckean uh and her son gideon drowned uh she was 40 and her son was only eight um, they took a canoe supposedly into a cove of the Chesapeake Bay just to retrieve a lost ball, and the wind and the waves were too much and carried them away, and they they drowned back on April second. It's uh, yeah, it's horrible. I um, did they go out without a paddle? I don't know what the the whole. I haven't read the whole thing on whether uh, on what happened. Just that the wind and the waves were too much. That would, I don't know. People are saying it was fairly not wise. To right. Do what she did, uh, to take to a canoe out. out into the Chesapeake Bay, but I guess they were in a little cove that they thought was sheltered, mm -hmm. and somehow. Oh yeah, just, and it was just oh, there's the ball. I can see it. Let's go mm -hmm. grab it. Let's just go and get somehow, it. And somehow, it's just yeah, they didn't find the little boy for a couple of days after finding her. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just uh, uh, you know, the people will always say uh, the Kennedy curse, and some might just say it's. You know, like JFK, it was a, it was human error. It was a dumb right. thing to do. I mean, I'm sorry, but it was stupid. And he flew uh, into and, conditions uh, he wasn't rated to fly in. Flew into the, a foggy no. day and crashed. Yeah. So there were dumb mistakes. And which was the? And, what was uh, the? Who was the one that died skiing, playing like football while skiing? Michael. Michael Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah or was it? It was a skiing. At, he wasn't playing football, was he? On skiing. They were, it, they were like playing catch, I think, or something like that. And she was kind of like skiing backwards or something, and went into a tree. I think is how that happened. Yeah. Is that? Is that? Sad. Is that the deaths of the month week? Two weeks. Uh, well, I'm sure there are loads more, but th you know that th I was watching. I just wanted to point out because it's a there was a guy. The guy we mentioned in the last uh, episode, Adam Schlesinger, uh, or Schlesinger, who wrote That Thing You Do. And uh, yesterday, that's like one of my all-time favorite <laughs> movies. And yesterday, the, the guys, the wonders, uh, the four actors, and a couple of the other ones popped in here and there, did a live commentary on YouTube. Oh, and it's, cool. And uh, it's really cool. And they were raising money for, uh, you know, for victims of uh, corona and uh, and if you it's on YouTube and there's a little link for the it's a it's a, you know, Corona 
in, in this guy's name, in this guy's memory. Yeah. And I'm sure it's on YouTube to watch. You know, they, don't, they couldn't watch it because of copyright. They couldn't actually play it. But they, they said, okay, right about now, hit play. Hit play. And, it's like riff uh, tracks. And, uh, yeah, 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 and it was it was awesome. It was really cool to sit through it and listen to the stories. And if you're looking for, I think Colin Hanks tweeted out a link to it as well on his Twitter okay. account. His okay, he was account. on it through the whole thing. So there you, you go. Know, yeah. I didn't realize that he was in the movie and he was an integral part. I mean, he came out with some really good stories. Colin uh, Hanks is in that movie. Yeah, yeah. Who is he in it? I've spent so long since I watched it. Well, he, he wasn't a featured player. I mean, there was a point where, where Liv uh, Tyler goes to, to watch the boys play uh, at CBS, Television City, and he escorts her. And there's a few, he was just an, really mm -hmm. an extra and probably an AP or something like that. Sure. But he, he, had, he was there for most of it for some of the editing, for the recording in the studio. And he had great stories about the shoots. And, and it, was, it was really, it was just a lot of fun. For someone who uh, likes that movie, you'd really enjoy it. And if you donate, it's still a good cause. <laughs> If and speaking of good causes, you like it, I just got stupid. <laughs> you're a dumb dumb. <laughs> now, one another good cause that I, I will shout out to because our our, our good friend, my good friend uh, Jeff Mantor, who owns Larry Edmonds Bookstore in Hollywood. Larry Edmonds is the last independent bookstore on in Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard. It's been around since 1938. He worked, uh, you know, his shop was represented in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and. Now that he, you know, his big, uh, uh, his big support for the year is the TCM festival in Hollywood that usually takes place in that area. With this going on, it just shut everything down. And Jeff is this lone bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard with his gate shut and rent has gone up and, mm. uh, it, it just sucks so bad because it's a real, you know, it's a bookstore that sells used books in Hollywood. If you want to go pick up a documentary or, or a book about, you know, I don't know, Fay Ray uh, or something like that, you know, it, that you will find it there. And it's been around, as I said, since 38. And they're they're suffering big time. And uh, I would just say a shout out if you there's a, you know, look up Larry Edmonds books, Larry Edmonds bookstore in Hollywood. And uh, if you can find it in your heart to give mm. them a couple of bucks, they are. Yes. Uh, it's a good people and institution. And uh, yeah, I hope somebody steps up. It'd be got to be sad for film lovers because there's so little left in Hollywood of old Hollywood and, and Larry Edmonds does celebrate that so anyway that's the last I'll say about it uh, I'm going to plug one more thing and then we'll get into our main feature uh, I just got uh, I just joined a documentary series for uh, the Discovery um, family on uh, Moto Trends TV which used to be Velocity it's a show called Autobiography and it's uh, a car history show and um, so I, I just joined as a producer, uh, bringing them some episode ideas and developing those out. Um, they already have their first season out, and it's really interesting. Uh, like they did a Ford versus Ferrari episode, which was you know the real story behind the movie, um, which was really interesting. And they did uh, there was a crazy story they did about. Um, this buried Ferrari that was buried in a yard in the 70s in um, South Central L.A. Mm -hmm. And it was dug up and it was uh, it was had been stolen from the Brown Derby on Wilshire. It was, wow. Guy, a guy went, the guy that owned it, went to the Brown Derby on a date, went inside, Pello parked it, came out, car was gone. And then turns up a few years later, buried in a yard in South LA. So Is there, was there anyone in it? No, luckily, no. That's always the big fear when you find a buried car. There was no body in it. It turned out it really was car thieves. And they just, they stole a car and then realized it was too hot because all the publicity it got. So they, um... So, not so they buried it. it. They buried it, no. thinking we'll unbury it later when you know the heat cools off, and and then we'll we'll unload it. And then it, they just, it just didn't happen, and it got discovered. So it's a really fascinating um, story. So, anyways, autobiography. It's it's a, a really cool uh, show, and I'm I'm glad I'm on it. So autobiography. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Cool. Because there was a lady that was some wacky lady that was buried in her car somewhere. There's a couple <laughs> of stories like that. You know, that I'm taking it with me kind of thing. And, oh, uh, I got yeah. you. I got you. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's other stories. Sometimes when you find a buried car, it's, it's, you know, foul play. It's mm -hmm. like that. It's a, a body is inside and they buried it, you know, kind of like the end of Psycho when it, when he, you know, he ditches the car in, in the, mo in the, in the bog with her body in the trunk. Uh, you yeah. know, that happens a lot. So yeah, there you go. Auto. So autobiography, one cool. word on uh, motor trends TV. Okay, this is a good one. My friend Donna, uh, Donna Lethal, 
uh, is her name, and she just sent me an article, which is which is pretty fascinating. It's in a it's in the article, and it's in an article in the British uh, tabloid tabloid. I guess you can call it the newspaper, the Guardian. And uh, the Guardian, you know, it's a legitimate news source for mm -hmm. for a lot of people, and they reference another newspaper called the Sun. And the Sun is just a tabloid. The Sun is just trashy news. But anyway, this references the Sun because there was a lawsuit because there was a woman in Leeds in England uh, who um, was sued the Sun because they outed her because because <laughs> they said that she was in a relationship with a 92-year-old chandelier mm. that she bought on eBay. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and, uh, and she, she basically is saying she was outed by that. And there's a term for that, uh, people that are in love object with... Object um, sexuality, I believe. Is, is that the what term it is? For it. Yeah. Object sexuality. And there's so, probably some other more scientific name, but yeah, that's... Yeah. Okay. So they're saying that they, that they outed her and she sued for that. I guess it was some sort of privacy issue. And one of the uh, defense, the defense that the son used was that she had already admitted to being in love. She changed her name to Liberty because she was in love with the Statue of Liberty. Uh, and um, so they were saying, you know, basically, you know, it's your own fault. And, uh, and, and the judge said that it does not count as a sexual orientation to be in love with an inanimate object. So uh, because, I mean, there's, you know, there's people, there's all kinds of people that are all in love with things. <laughs> um, you know, there was that TLC had like an extreme show. I like the like the eating one. You know, I love mm -hmm. that. Like and uh, extreme addiction. You know, people eating their sofa and, and still I love like dryer <laughs> sheets. And uh, and there was one. I remember there was a guy that was in love with his car, and uh, and he literally had a sexual relationship with his car, which is um, <laughs> interesting. TLC. <laughs> I um I remember there was a story. I think years ago, a guy was in love with his toaster oven. I want to say. And uh, hopefully he didn't try to have sex with that. At least not while it was plugged in. Plugged. Right. <laughs> I said plugged. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I think I feel like we've covered the world so far. Uh, are we ready for the main feature? We ready? know everything now. <laughs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything that's important. Uh, time for the main feature. Ready. Jazz hands. Let's do it. It's time for the main feature. So we're talking about James Bond. You got to say it. You got to say it the way it's meant. Bond. James Bond. There you are. It's got to be Shake, done once. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there are officially 25 Bond films that are considered, you know, official canon produced by Eon Productions. Um, there's been some that were produced out, away from them that are not considered official. Um, but the main ones are these 25 films. They star um, six different actors have been Bond in those 25 films. Um, the most recent one was supposed to have just come out a couple weeks ago. Coincidentally, mm -hmm. and uh, that's with Daniel Craig, uh, No Time to Die, uh, uh, directed by Kerry Fukunaga, which I was really excited to see because he directed all the episodes in the first season of True Detective with Matthew McConaughey. Mm -hmm. uh, he mm -hmm. was that like genius that you know that directed those that thing. So I was really excited to see what he what he's done with this, and it's been pushed uh, from April release to uh, November now. And they're talking about it's going to lose like at least fifty million dollars supposedly, and a lot of movies are because they're they're everything this had a theatrical release is disappearing now, and and the blockbusters what is it, the the studios must be panicking right now over what they're going to do because the summer blockbuster series season is going to be almost non-existent at least yeah. in the U.S., which is their biggest market. So yeah, and with I mean nobody there's such a spoiled for choice. Um, you know, on, on every streaming service, that it's mm -hmm. going to be difficult to release a feature film premiere on a platform when there's so many other choices. Nobody's going to want to pay for it, right. you know, because they did that uh, uh, um, Invisible Man that just came out right before all this went down with Elizabeth and Moss. Yeah, 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 and they they went straight to video on that one or straight to download, and it was it was high price, but sure. uh, I wonder what the you know, if someone's going to pay fifteen bucks to download it when when they can I, watch everything else for free or on whatever I, their subscription. Is. I can speak for myself. Like I would pay ten or fifteen dollars to watch a James Bond in home streaming in four K. You know, on my yeah. on my TV, I would do that. I don't know if everybody would do that and how much of a difference it, they're taking a huge risk um, in doing that because then how do you release it theatrically after you've already released it 
digitally. It's and also, just, you uh, can't control crazy. it once it's once it's on the internet. You can't control it, and you mm -hmm. know it's gonna hit it's gonna hit the pirate sites right away. Right. And people are gonna go, why should I? You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. It's just well, anyway, it's a, it's more fallout from all of this. But yep. but I'm looking forward to uh, to that that film because I do. I, I've never been a Bond freak i've never gone i gotta go see this movie but every time i watch one i really enjoy it they are so fun and i really like daniel craig as james bond i'm one of the mm -hmm. i was on board with that from when it was first announced i remember it was controversial uh, a lot of people weren't in favor of him as bond but then he brought like a physicality action star-ness to it that hadn't really totally existed up to that mm -hmm. point uh, it was very yeah. uh, i think inspired probably by the jason bourne franchise uh kind of making him more physical and there, there's there's always outrage when it comes to change, always, mm -hmm. uh, because there was talk of Idris, um, Idris, Idris Elba, mm -hmm. yes, and then uh, then there I was talk about female, a female uh, Bond. There was talk about really fairly recently, which of course you know the internet went crazy. So mm -hmm. um, you know because people just don't like change, and those are pretty major changes to yeah. something that people have been familiar with for over fifty years. So I, I can understand how people would be uncomfortable with change. They However, have an idea of their, that's the last of their entire life of what James Bond is. So yeah. don't mess with that, right? Right. That's it's their, a different yeah. generation, though, because the original James Bond generation is, you know, if they're not dead yet, they're on their way out. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're, sure. they're an older generation, and that generation is leaving, and we, you know, or me, uh, I'll, I'll be the next generation heading into that area. But, you know, I remember when those movies came out, and, uh, you know, but the stars of them are, you know, dwindling. So, um so you yeah. said at the beginning of this, you know, we, we can, we, you just only, we could talk for six hours about this subject if we really wanted yeah. to dive into it. So we have to focus on the, the, the more, the things that are interesting to us, right? Yeah. Um, so where do, where do you want to start? Well, the, I mean, the starting, the logical point would be Ian Fleming because he wrote, you know, he started the, uh, with the books, with, with the, the, books, with the right? short stories and, uh, and ultimately, you know, somebody said, Hey, let's make a movie out of this. And, and he had uh, said when he wrote the books, he pictured David Niven. Yeah, yeah. As the character. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, which would have been, you know, elegant enough. But sure. David Niven wasn't an athletic man. And there had to be, you know, he had to be built. He had to be a sexy guy that people really desired. And uh, and uh, David Niven, I don't think, was that guy. He was a right. gentleman, but he wasn't uh, he wasn't a sexual attraction or an attract not necessarily an attractive man. He was a good looking guy, but he was, you know, aristocratic rather than. You know, somebody right. that when they went to make the movies, they were like, no, we're going to have sexy guys. We're not going to have kind of reserved gentlemanly types uh, uh, like David Niven, I guess. We, yeah, we need a yeah. guy that can take his shirt off. <laughs> guess, right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've never saw him Niven without a shirt on. So I can't yeah. say, you know, I could see where the other guys and, you know, Roger Moore was sort of that Niven type, too. Absolutely. But then Roger Moore was built, you know, and Niven was not a classically good looking guy you know he was mm -hmm. he was not he was he was handsome in his own way but and, he's not the guy and Roger you know. Moore was like the leisure suit bond <laughs> in that <laughs> right. era <you> know? <laughs> yeah yeah those were really yeah those were like uh yeah like Barbie dolls for you know every every you know here's him skiing here's him <laughs> scuba diving you know uh, I, I think that maybe G.I. Joe riffed on those things or Action Man riffed on those things mm -hmm. where you know they because with the success of G.I. Joe and all these because I remember G.I. Joe had all kinds of weird little get-ups. Astronaut G.I. Joe. and mm -hmm. So it would make sense that uh, that they were... And Matchbox hit into it, you know, because the Goldfinger... Uh, uh, is it a uh, Aston Martin? Was it? I think Goldfinger, or was it a... Um, yeah, he he had... A, his famous for his an Aston Martin DB5, the silver okay. car that's, that they've brought back for some of the newer Bond films as well as a throwback. Yeah, the, the famous Aston Martin, which they those go for, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars now mm -hmm. if you can find one of those old Aston Martins. And that's one of the top top ever matchbox toys, you know, little toy cars. And I mm. remember we, my neighbor had one of those. They had little guns that came out and and right. uh, you know, little little gadgets that were stuck on it and uh those were you know, the 60s were great, man. Yeah, they were um, they were great. Mel, Mel Blanc's big car wreck where he almost died. Uh, was in an Aston Martin, uh, a precursor to the DB5. 
Oh, it's funny because I was going to mention that accident today because he's Dead Man's Curve. That's Dead know? Man's Curve. That's what inspired yeah. the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. A lot yeah, of people he, uh, think. He, he ran into a, someone came across the line, a, a college kid came over in a big American Oldsmobile mm -hmm. and just crushed his little British <laughs> Aston Martin. And, and he broke every ma almost every major bone in his body and shouldn't have survived, but he did. And famously did his voice of Barney Rubble from the hospital bed. He did like 40 a lot of episodes people from, the, from, did, his, uh, from his bed, yeah. The because uh, there's three dead man's curves in Los Angeles. There's the one that he was almost killed on, which is in front of UCLA. Mm -hmm. There's the one that a lot of people think it is, which is that S curve over went just to the Whittier entrance of Bel Air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the other one is Whittier Drive, where Jan Barry had his near fatal accident right, right. off the sunset. So, uh, uh, but yeah, but that's the real one. The one that they wrote that inspired the song was the Mel Blanc one by UCLA. Mm -hmm. So, um, so back, back to Fleming. So Fleming, uh, you know, he was military. He he was uh, there. There is what's fascinating about this is there are real spy stories in this. You know, like we talked about Pussy Galore. Pussy Galore was a real spy, mm -hmm. and and Fleming was involved with that. And the guy when they the guy that did all the gadgets was it Q uh, that did the gadgets mm -hmm. and right. uh, and uh, he you know he was involved with spy work and gadgets and they would they would MI six which is the British CIA, they mm -hmm. would exchange information about certain gadgets. And he, he would say, we have an idea for this, but this is going to mess up with anything you're doing over there. Uh, <laughs> but it was all the, uh, you know, he came up with, uh, you know, the pen cameras and the, the, you know, there was there was a lot of legitimacy to a lot of those those uh, gadgets. And uh, uh, and they're they're really cool. They're really clever. But Ian Fleming himself was uh, was military. And uh, and uh, Ian Fleming actually has a, an airport named after him, which is kind of funny, um, in, in Jamaica. But uh, uh -huh. he he because um, he lived he was, there, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not where he died, but it is where he lived for sure. And uh, and it's funny to say he was um, he had a heart attack, and while he was in his hospital bed, they they told him to uh, consider writing a like a bedtime story or something like that for his kids, and uh, and he wrote. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. Ian Fleming is the uh, <laughs> is the author of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Holy which, cow! Uh, I know, right? And uh, and uh, and that's you know, think about Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Chitty had all the gadgets in the car and all that sort of business, oh, much like right. much like the Bond stuff. And also, the movie was produced by Cubby Broccoli, who you know produced all the Bond films. Right. And uh, and uh, yeah, so it's just a, a fascinating. A lot of people don't put that connection together. And the guy that played uh, the King in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang also was one of the guys that played one of the Bond villains too. Uh, huh. which is I know it's fascinating so so the the Connery uh, movies were uh, Russia with Love Goldfinger Thunderball You Only Live Twice Diamonds Are Forever and uh, I think those were the ones and then Connery didn't want to do it anymore and he was afraid of being typecast so that's when they went with Roger Moore who was originally considered but Roger Moore was involved with another show and couldn't uh, uh, free himself well up and I think in the middle there was Lazenby, right? Uh, he, oh, that's right. You're right. 69 was Honor Majesty's Secret Service. That was George Lazenby, right? I have right. a George Who's... Lazenby story. Yeah? I have a couple, actually. So George Lazenby is famous because he's the only person who had played Bond only once in the official 25 movies. Uh -huh. um, and he, <laughs> there, first of all, there's a really great documentary that came out a couple years ago, um, and I believe it's still on Hulu, and it is called... Um, Becoming Bond, and it is a really well-made documentary all about his experience, his life, and then his how he became Bond and how, um, basically, how he blew it. He famously blew this amazing opportunity because they wanted him to keep coming back and do more James Bonds, and he just got real full of himself. He was the youngest person to ever play Bond. He was only 29, and I think he showed up at the at the world premiere like in a beard with like his hair kind of grown out, like he was like like a like he was in the Beatles. And it was and they were like, "What are you doing? You're supposed to be James Bond." And he just got yeah. this he just got this attitude of, "I'm too good for this now. I've got 18 other offers on the table now. I can do anything I want." Kind of a guy. I don't want to be this puppet you know being told what to do in this James Bond character and controlled and his uh, his career, his acting career never uh, ever recovered after that and it's really fascinating i came across him years ago i was working for this martial arts tv network and uh we put on this b movie called death dimension 
<laughs> which was an action, a martial arts action movie. And he played the the police captain. And this this was, you know, almost a decade after he was James Bond. And here he is playing, you know, police captain in this very forgettable uh, action thing. Um, and then the other thing is, I uh, when I lived in Santa Monica, he l- apparently lived nearby. And there was a restaurant that I frequented there that he apparently was known to hang out in. So he was across the street at this bar, and his movie was playing at the theater across the street on his majesty's secret service and everybody in the bar is telling him hey you should go over there and say hi to everybody he's like nah i don't need that you know i don't i'm over the bond thing whatever well apparently somebody told the audience (laughs) across the street in the theater that hey george lazenby is across the street right now and when the movie came out everybody in the theater came into this restaurant and he ended up having he ended up having a great time posing for photos and you know got to be the toast of the night um but he kind of he's he's you know he's an, he's an old man now, but he kind of looks like an old Cary Grant. You know he still kind of got the the old the looks, I guess, in his in his old age, and uh, is you know, I guess content with his life. But I, I really recommend becoming Bond on Hulu. It's really um, it's really really an interesting piece of uh, Hollywood history, mm-hmm, movie history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a documentary in the Bond Girls too. It, it's so oh. this is such a a. <laughs> crazy franchise because it just branches out into 20 different ways and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know you could have a, a James Bond I'm sure there's a James Bond weapons documentary the cars <laughs> of James Bond you know right. the girls the girls the, the villains I'm sure there's 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 mm-hmm. you know things devoted to all of these certainly on the internet but uh, but uh, yeah 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 it's 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 hard to whittle down but uh, Roger Moore live and let die man with the golden gun the spy who loved me Moonraker, For Your Eyes Only, Octopussy, and A View to a Kill. Which a lot of those, I mean, Spy Who Loved Me and A View to a Kill, I mean, classic songs involved mm-hmm. with that, you know. What's your favorite Bond, Bond song? Oh, 100,000 times Goldfinger. I, I, Goldfinger! Like, yeah. <laughs> Shirley Bassey is, you know, she's from Wales, and she... Uh, and she, they call her, the nickname is Leather Lungs, because that, that woman can, <laughs> she could belt. And she did, you know, Hey Big Spender. And she did another Bond thing. Um, um, I'll think of it in a second. Do you remember a couple of years ago on the Academy Awards, they had a, it was a 50th anniversary of James Bond. I think it's what, I think it was 50. And, uh, and it was going to be a big deal because all the Bonds are going to be out on stage. And Shirley Bassey was going to come out and mm-hmm. sing Goldfinger. And it was so exciting. But it turns out Connery, as I understand it, isn't doing great. And he couldn't show up. And without him, what's the point? You know? Right. So uh, doing this whole reunion. So it was a big tribute to James Bond. And Shirley Bassey came out. And she killed it. I mean, she was spectacular, as she always does. But uh, it, it just didn't have the oomph if all the actors would have been there. And I, I do think it was because uh, the Connery isn't doing terrific. But Shirley Bassey, Goldfinger by far. What about yourself? Uh, you Only Live Twice, Nancy Sinatra. I yeah. love that song. Uh, and John Barry, you know, who composed the, the famous James Bond scores, he composed the song. And I guess they supposedly they wanted Frank to do it. He said no. So Nancy did it. And um, I read an account that she was very nervous to record it, and it took 25 different takes for them really? to, to stitch the song together because she was so nervous. But I love that song. And second for me would probably be uh, Live and Let Die. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, those are great. So, like, Paul McCartney took, man, and that's there's like been a two bunch of songs really good in there. there. You know, there's like three songs in that song. You know, it just switches <laughs> modes so many times. Right. Uh, but uh, the other one, Carly Simon, you know, nobody does it better. At, uh, All and, classics. Uh, well, yeah, she did... Um, the man who lo- the spy who loved me and uh, and also oh god Sheena Easton did for your for your eyes only view to a kill was Duran Duran mm-hmm. uh, diamonds are forever that was the other one that Shirley Bassey did didn't mm-hmm. uh, didn't uh, didn't uh, live and let die Paul McCartney who spy who loved me and what else didn't didn't Sheena Easton do another one well I let's mean, not for- let's not forget uh, the Madonna classic no <laughs> uh, does that even exist. <laughs> I hope I hope it's been like lost. I hope it's been buried in the desert somewhere. <laughs> Didn't she? Isn't nobody does it better? Isn't that a uh, is that a Bond song? Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. it's it's in the opening credits of one of the songs. Nobody does it better. Yeah. 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 It was from a spy who loved me. That's right. And so she must have done. Sorry, just screw, just screw what I just said. So the spy who loved me. I keep thinking it was 
It was two songs that she did, but no, it was one song she did, and that was Nobody Does It Better, and that was the theme, yeah. So, but she, I mean, she's great. I love Carly Simon, too, but, um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Nobody Does It Better is karaoke sung very poorly at the at the hotel bar by Anna Ferris in Lost okay. in Translation, and she sings this very off-key uh, version of the song, and, and Scarlett Johansson and Bill Murray laugh laugh at how bad it is. And and move on, and uh, yeah, and supposedly the Anna Faris character is based on Cameron Diaz in that movie. Didn't you do karaoke in a movie, Cameron Diaz? Really shitty. Yeah, uh, my best friend's wedding. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yep. yeah. all right. Yep, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, she gets kind of thinking that it. Julia Roberts makes her do it, thinking that she'll be horrible and it'll it'll hurt her with her fiance, and it ends up being adorable. How bad she is, and mm-hmm. ends up backfiring on julie roberts yeah that's how i remember it anyways okay anyways well, hey, like... james bond <laughs> oh wait no wait hang on one second so i gotta go I, when i was doing my research you just mentioned that uh the uh, bond theme was re- was recorded by or was written by uh uh john barry uh, there's that's a that's a conflict because there's another guy named marty norman who who claims to have written it and there was a lawsuit about this oh really because yeah 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 because uh marty norman and i think they actually uh gave uh uh, marty norman monty norman the credit for it i think that um i think that john barry wrote the original bit and but they ended up using one of his songs in the movie and recommissioning the theme and this guy monty norman who's as i still alive he's 92 years old Wow. Uh, Cubby, Cubby Broccoli composed. So he's the one that did the dan da da and Right, uh, the famous uh, tune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I, that's a, it's a, you know, every success, you know, Richard O'Brien said that success has many fathers, but failure is always an orphan. <laughs> and, uh, you know. I also got to say, I really liked the Adele song. I thought it was, a, I thought that's one of the best Bonds, because it's in, it was done in a classic 60s orchestration, I felt yeah. like. It had that 60s vibe to it. I miss when songs like that, you know, were on the radio. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's no real, I don't want to say pop music, but I mean, you know, there's songs like that just don't get airplay. And, right. And uh, it's, it's, uh, With of course, big back, jazz you know, orchest- band orchestrations yeah. behind them. And yeah, yeah, you don't see that much. So back to, to Roger Moore. So I, I do have a spectacular Roger Moore story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, this is like one of the I can't best. Wait. <laughs> and name dropping, you know. Okay, do it. So drop away, so, drop carpet bomb his name all over the show. <laughs> I had I had dinner with Roger Moore once, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He ended up where he was on a TV show, and I was in the green room because I knew the host. And after the show was over with, he made it very uncomfortable if we refused to go to have dinner with him. So it was sort of like, oh, I insist kind of a thing. <laughs> so after the show was taped, we went, uh, you know, not very far away to a restaurant and it was he and his last wife, Kiki, and uh, and two or three of his children, I think two of his children. And, uh, and during dinner, it was the weirdest thing because we sat down, my ex and I, and not shortly after we sat down, he had this thing in his hand and he, he was going like this and people, everyone was cracking up on the table. And, you know, we're just looking at each other, my ex and I, like, you know, what the hell's going on? And these guys are, like, red-faced, laughing really, really hard. <laughs> so finally, Kiki leans, leans over, and behind my ex is a fart machine. So so <laughs> <laughs> they put it in the middle of the table, and Roger Moore is clicking, and this thing is farting, making fart sounds. And these guys are just dying, laughing. The whole, We're just looking at each other, like, you know, of course you have to laugh because it's Roger Moore. <laughs> and uh, you know, and uh, it was just a really weird experience. And his daughter was really sweet. His daughter, you could tell that there was a lot of weird tension between the two of them, too, because she, she lived here, I guess. And she said she was at the gym in West Hollywood. And and I, I got this real impression that she was trying really hard to please him, and uh-huh. she says, "Oh, Daddy, when I was in the gym one time, the you know the front of the gym, the door just turned black, and uh, and I looked, and Arnold Schwarzenegger walked in the room, and that was the end of the story." <laughs> and Roger Moore, Roger Moore is like, and then what happened? <laughs> anyway, 
And he just, I would, it was such a horrible, horrible, uncomfortable pause. And it was just like, it was almost intentional. It had to have been. And it was Oof. really uncomfortable. But it ended up when we, after we ate, there was a, you know, we ordered coffees. And, uh, and the waiter came over and he's got this, he's got the cappuccino. I ordered a cappuccino. And he, and he fell over and he threw it on me. And it was a phony cappuccino that Roger Moore had brought to the restaurant. <laughs> so, it was, I mean, honest to God, it was surreal. But uh, but yeah, that was Roger Moore and the fart machine is one of my one of my favorite celebrity encounters. And being a, a fake cappuccino being thrown on me, uh, courtesy of Roger Moore, was pretty cool. So, so he was a prankster. <laughs> he was a prankster then, kind of like, like yeah. George Clooney and Brad Pitt are both known for being pranksters. Probably yeah. better pranks. <laughs> you don't buy him at a joke shop. But More elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> you get him out of the back of magazines. You know, send or the fart machine. But yeah, here, <laughs> buy the the fake poop. <laughs> right, the fake dog. Right, basically, yeah, <laughs> basically. Uh, so Roger Moore, uh, you know, he had bouts with illness. He he had uh, prostate cancer, and he had, a, yeah, I guess it was a, a severe uh, issue with kidney stones. And he had been uh, very ill. Actually, he was married, I think, four times. And his first wives, uh, he was very public about saying they were abusive to him. Uh, one, one, he said that you know she took a guitar and threw it over his head. The other one was throwing yeah. bricks at him, and uh, so he was pretty, pretty, you know, adamant about that. It's well researched, and and, and he said, yeah, he had a real problem with that. But his last wife was Kiki or, or Christina, I think is what they called her, but uh, the, but he referred to her as Kiki. That they had a very, a very sane relationship, mm. and um, and Roger Moore at the uh, at the end was living in Switzerland, I think it was. And um, and uh, and that is where he ended up passing away of a heart attack. And um, I read that he uh, I read he died from prostate cancer. Well, he had prostate cancer. I know that. Mm. But I don't think what the actual final thing was is. Yeah, yeah, may have been a heart attack. Yeah, he died on uh, May 23rd, 2017. He was 89 uh, years old. And uh, and he was Sir. He was Sir Roger Moore. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He was knighted. In fact, Michael Caine told a story in his book about Roger Moore. He said, Michael Caine said he was walking down or walking down the road with Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stones, and his phone rang, and uh, and he's talking, and he says he's talking about the royal family or the Queen or something like that. Roger, I mean, uh, Michael Caine said Charlie Watts after he hangs up saying, "Who was that?" He said, "Well, that was Roger Moore. He's on his way to Buckingham Palace, and he's going to be knighted. And he's afraid when he kneels down, he's got bad knees. He's afraid that his <laughs> that his uh, that the Queen's going to have to help, you know, pull him up again. But Charlie Watts, for some reason, knew that there's a railing there, and they that taking into consideration someone who mm. might be a bit older will be able to to use it to get him get, uh, get himself up. But, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> he should have brought but his was, he should have brought his fart machine." <laughs> right, <laughs> a little air propulsion. But I've got Donna again, Donna Lethal, to help me find that that little bit of information because that's a great little story. Wow. And uh, and 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 again, well liked uh, by most people. I mean, he said he had a drinking problem. He said he was a really unpleasant person, especially to his kids. He was largely, you know, uh, vacant or not around at the time they were growing up. Their their mm. their, their younger years. So so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, sad. He was in Spice World too. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, it does have his cause of death. You're right; it's prostate cancer. Ultimately, how could you? How could you say no to Spice World? You know, there were a lot of good people in that. You know, Meatloaf was in that, and there there were some good stars. I in love that. you we say there's the really great. good people in that, and then Meatloaf is the first Meatloaf. example. Oh, I was, I'm, I go to Rocky Horror all the time because Richard O'Brien was in it, and you know, but Spice World. I, mean, I like that kind of stuff. I was there. I was living there when the Spice Girls were huge, and mm. uh, and so it's a, I'm a fond of that sort of time period. I kind of like right. them. And I would pay to see them. If they came around, I would absolutely pay. I would buy a ticket to see the Spice Girls, no doubt. Yep. <laughs> hey, by the way, did you go to did you go to the Madonna concert? Oh, that's a bad I can't remember. Story. Did we talk about did we wrap that because I remember we talked about you were mad about it because oh, the time change. Bad. Yeah, no, I got Did you end I up got, going to it though? No, it bit me in the ass. I don't you know. You sold them? I, <laughs> I got ripped off. Oh no. Eighteen hundred bucks. Eighteen hundred oh, bucks, man! Gosh. I got ripped off. There was a. I. I am such a dolt. I am a trusting person, and oh. I got screwed over. Long story, very awful. That was that one hurt big time. And, uh, so uh, while we're on the know. subject, um, if you guys want to go to our Patreon and help Scott out, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, eighteen hundred bucks. Oh, that hurt, man. That hurt. 
We need to play some like Sarah McLaughlin in the background here, so people have their heartstrings pulled. And <laughs> eighteen. Oh my god! Well, you're gonna play Madonna. Oh, have you got? Have you watched her Instagram things? She's no. got her, her her lockdown videos. Oh, her, oh it's gosh. like really, you know, she is she is in her own Madonna land. And, I don't want to uh, hear from any rich person in their in what their lockdown is like. Cause she was in her she was in her bathtub, and I think her rose is floating with her. Of and course, she's like, you know, this is the great equalizer. You know the coronavirus. <laughs> it's like you know. So she does these really well lit. You know, pretends to be typing her diaries. And uh, did you ever see Medusa with Julie Brown when that was a send up of no. Madonna? And it was great because Madonna did her truth or dare, and Julie Brown the comic did a, a Medusa, and and she bro- <laughs> she resurrected the character uh, recently on Instagram to uh, sort of poke fun at Madonna, who deserves it because <laughs> she's outrageous. She is outrageous. So Ian Fleming, the, he wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, as I mentioned, and it wasn't published until uh, two months after his death, which is, you know, so he, he, he didn't live around to see the book being released or the film coming out. But uh, Amazing. He, died, he missed all the I, franchise of his, of his own creation. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wonder Seriously. how much of the uh, how much of the estate goes to the family, you know, because right. uh, most of it probably goes to, you know, Cubby Broccoli's family. Uh, mm-hmm. who produced most of the films, who made his money in broccoli, really, literally selling broccoli. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Truly. And wow. uh, so anyway, Fleming himself died in uh, 12th of August, 1964. He was 56 years old. Now, uh, interesting story about him. His last words, he was in the ambulance uh, from a heart attack going to the hospital. And this is so, so very British. He said to the ambulance drivers, he says, I'm so sorry to have troubled you chaps. I don't know how you get along it's so fast in traffic on the roads these days. <laughs> the end. So that's, that was, yeah, I, it's, it's, so, it's so very David Niffin, you know. And, uh, so, so very so, British, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's, and he's buried in, uh, in England, uh, where he's from, in uh, Severhampton in Wiltshire in, uh, in England. Interesting thing about Shirley Bassey. Okay, so she wrote uh, Diamonds Are Forever, and, or she sang Diamonds Are Forever and Hey Big Spender and, uh, and Goldfinger. And, uh, and uh, she was born in Cardiff, which is the same place Tom Jones is from in Wales. And, and she actually had a hit in the early 90s with a group called the Propeller Heads, and it was called History Repeating. And she, <laughs> she said, I don't know anything about this stuff. I just did it for my grandkids. But interesting about Shirley Bassey is that uh, she had a daughter, she's 21 years old, called Samantha, who fell to her death uh, in Bristol, in England, uh, over the, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Now, I've been to Bristol many times, and this bridge is one of the most horrific, high, high bridges. I mean, it is so scary <laughs> to go up there. I mean, and also it's a popular suicide location. And mm-hmm. I, I'm talking, I mean, it's major. Like, the cars look like little tiny, you know, things when they're going by. And they had to mm-hmm. put a big thing over the cars going by because of the people jumping off the bridge. Jeez. And uh, it was Shirley Bassey maintained that her daughter did not commit suicide, said that it was, uh, it was a, uh, a murder. And did uh, someone threw her like, off the bridge? Yes. But the police huh. in various investigations, because the case was reopened uh, uh, another time, but they say they couldn't find any criminal activity. But Shirley Bassey maintains that she was, there was an yeah. issue with an ex-boyfriend who, you know, and another person who was guilty of another murder. Mm. So, uh, mm. so Bassey was, was convinced, but, uh, but uh, the police said no, there was no, no criminal. A lot uh, of times, a lot of times the suicides, the family isn't, won't accept that that's what it was. Yeah. I think that's common. Yeah. And, and, and maybe she's right. Maybe she's correct that it was foul play. But yeah. 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 I mean, because it's possible there was a legitimate theory. Mm-hmm. But sure. uh, and also, yeah, there's a stigma that uh, is is attached to that. Sometimes families uh, like that. Yeah. that out. <laughs> so uh, and then we have, you know, the other bonds are still alive. You know, Pierce Brosnan and, and, uh, and Timothy Dalton, who played him twice. Uh-huh. And um, and uh, and Daniel Craig, and I think those are the only ones. There's right? six, there yeah, no... yeah. Oh, and then we yeah. talked about George Lazenby already, yeah. And Connery, and he's still and, alive. And more. Yeah. Yep. And and I think that uh, you just said Daniel Daniel Craig is is a good choice for Bond. Did you see when they did? Uh, uh, they had the Olympics in Britain a couple of years ago, and the opening for the Olympics was uh, was him going to Buckingham Palace, and the Queen actually participated in it, which is something that. Uh, would normally never happen, but they, he had her picking, picking her up 
at Buckingham Palace. And, uh, uh. and she got into the helicopter and everything. And I, I, I have to watch that again. I don't know if it actually happened that way, but it appeared that the queen was coming down in a parachute or something like that. That's right. But, I remember something she, about that, yeah. She did participate, which was pretty cool because it, it shows that she has the right advisors, you know, because it lightened her up for mm -hmm. another generation. I have a friend who is a fitness trainer and a lot of their uh, clients are A-list actors that, you know, we don't realize that these action stars, they're, they're oftentimes, you know, men in their 40s and 50s, and they're expected to have the physique of a 20-year-old professional athlete when mm -hmm. they're on screen. And, and, and you look at, you know, sometimes Leonardo DiCaprio get dragged because he gets, you know, photographed out in public between movies and he's got a bit of a paunch, you know, and they're like, oh, he's letting himself go. And it's like, yeah, because it's not normal for a middle-aged person to look like that all the time. And my friend made the point that, you know, Daniel Craig, when he has to be Bond, I mean, he's 52 now. And he got injured on the set of Spectre when he was doing that a few years ago. He injured his knee and he got really mad because they went over budget or they went over uh, schedule. And so he, he basically he has to keep a, a, this crazy regimen up that is only humanly possible for a few months when it comes to the diet and the exercise in order to, to make yourself look the way that he looks on screen. And so if something goes over time, it just makes that that physical torture lasts even longer and it increases the odds that, that they get injured doing stuff, which he was on Spectre. And then after that, he said he wasn't going to do another bond. Um, and then, you know, l luckily he, he's done a couple more since then, but yeah, it didn't rate open my eyes to, um, the kind of training regimens that these guys have to go through to look the way they do and, and the stress it puts on their bodies. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching, uh, uh, Harrison Ford and in, in Indiana Jones, you know, and he, again, you know, to have that kind of ripped body to be, you know, old, older person, that that that's hard work. That is real. Yep. That's like that's like eight hours a day kind of exercise. Yep. You yeah, and you just you and, just get injured more. I mean, you can get injured getting out of bed the wrong way, yeah. you know, at a certain point. So, yeah. Respect. Well, yeah, I mean, it's wild when people go through those transformations for a movie. The guy that was in that Jurassic Park movie not that long ago was another one that was uh, like, ben, wow. uh, Pratt, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris Pratt. So, um, yeah. And uh, Kumail, so, uh, Kumail, who was in the uh, the um, the Big Sick that he wrote with his wife and starred in. Uh, he's, a, he's on um, uh, Silicon Valley. He came out with some photos recently. He got super ripped for some role, and he put some Instagram photos out of it, and he said basically like, this is not possible for most people. This is only possible because the studio gave me a trainer and a dietitian <laughs> to turn me into this. He's like, I would not have been able to do this on my own. So don't think that, that this is any attainable <laughs> standard for the average <laughs> yeah. person to like hold them to, you know, I couldn't have done this by myself. So, and that is literally torture. That is literally torture that these guys go through. Uh, but they're they're well compensated, you know. Uh, I'm not going to say I wouldn't sign up for that, but you know, for six months of work to to go into that, as long as uh, with that kind of payoff, yeah, that'd be kind of nice. I do, I do, I do that for six months for like ten million dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I could do that. I could go on a and vegetable then I pull diet. a George Lazen and I pull a George Lazen beam. Like, okay, I'm good. I don't got to do that again. Well, dine out on the <laughs> I was the one James Bond story for the rest of your life, and you could, and you right. could. Who's next? Okay, well, well, you know, I was just thinking we we dipped into the we did all the bonds, we acknowledged all the bonds, uh, so logically where we go next, and 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 again, it opens up a whole can of worms, uh, the Bond girls, you know, mm -hmm. because there are so many, and it becomes confusing because some of the people that are considered Bond girls were actually villains, so they're not technically Bond girls. The villain, right. the Bond girls were like the love interest kind of ones. So, mm -hmm. uh, so again, I I, I just figured we. would jump into a few that are interesting names, you know, people that have gone on, because there are a lot of ones that did the, I was a Bond girl once, you know, and some of the people are more famous than the others. Right. Uh, like, like Honor Blackman, uh, like Diana Rigg, who, who was, um, I think it was the first time, and it was, it was the Lazenby Bond that she was married to Bond. It's the only time that ever, she played, oh. uh, she played Tracy Bond. And it's the only time Bond was ever uh, was ever married was the uh, was in was in the Lash and B uh, mm -hmm. Bond, and uh, that was on Her Majesty's uh, Secret Service. Daniela Banki, uh, uh, she was Tatiana Romanova and from Russia from Russia with Love, still alive. Barbara Bach, who played Anya Amasova, Agent Triple X <laughs> in The Spy Who Loved Me, married Ringo Starr in 1981. 
uh, uh, when they were in a caveman, a movie called Caveman. In fact, Barbara Bach <laughs> called uh, called James Bond afterwards a chauvinist pig because he would throw women in front of guns, you know, to save himself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which makes sense. Which is bad. I mean, he is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the women that were in the move in one of the movies, Goldfinger, famously, Goldfinger seems to be, I think, the most iconic James Bond movie because mm -hmm. that's the one that so many characters came from, and she right. was the uh, the girl that was painted gold in the movie, mm -hmm. and and she ended up on the cover of Life uh, in that famous pose where she was covered in this gold paint, and suppose mm -hmm. in the movie they were suffocating her because the skin can't breathe through gold paint, but it was uh, <laughs> but she was iconic most definitely, mm -hmm. and Jill Masterson was her name. And uh, she retired from acting in '69, but she's still around. I see her around at the uh, at the uh, autograph shows. And uh, another one that was it's interesting was uh, Britt Eklund, who uh, was a you know sort of a sex bomb in the uh, in the '60s, and she was involved in a relationship with some fascinating people. She was involved with Peter Sellers. She was involved with uh, Lou Adler. He had a son hmm. with Lou Adler, and uh, and I she's on my radar because she is responsible for the Rocky Horror Picture Show because she saw it in London at the Royal Court Theater when it first premiered six weeks at the upstairs 60-seat theater. She saw it, and she brought Lou Adler to come and see it and said, you got to see this. And he saw mm -hmm. it, and he opened it here as a play in, in Sunset, on Sunset Boulevard, and ultimately co-produced the movie. But uh, so, yeah. so Britt Eklund, who, uh, you know, she's, she's still around too, uh, is, uh, you know, largely responsible for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So I think it's, uh, I always got to go there too. It's like Helter Skelter, Rocky Horror. And, uh, and, um, and that's, that's what I do. The other girls that are famous, Ursula Andress, who, you know, famously came out of the water with a knife, uh, you know, and a bikini. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I met her one time too. And she called me a colossus. How was that? She said, you're a colossus. Because I was, <laughs> she did. She really did. I mean, I was, you know, we we I had a proper conversation. I was introduced. I mean, it was it wasn't like I was just, mm -hmm. you know, grabbed her. She was walking by. But oh, uh, you're but, a colossus. Yeah, so, yeah that's a yeah, different she context. Did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was in a friendly setting, and and uh, but anyway, Ursula Andress and Halle Berry recreated that scene. You know, when she right. was in the Bond movie too. So, um, but yeah, and then you have the Bond, the Bond villains. And uh, you've got uh, Charles Gray, another Rocky Horror reference, because he played Blofeld. Blofeld was a victim, or was a um, was a uh, character that showed up in several Bond movies and was played mm -hmm. by several actors. And uh, the first couple of times, it was only by the back of his head and his hands and a dubbed over voice, like uh, Charlie's Angels right. was. Uh, but then, uh, and then maybe where they got it from. And then Charles Gray played him. Uh, he died in uh, of a heart attack in London at the age of seventy one, and you only lived twice. And he also played him another person in, called Dicko Dico Henderson in another Diamonds Are Forever movie. But then they brought him back for Blofeld. Tali Chevalis uh, played Blofeld. Donald Pleasance in You Only Live Twice. Max von Sydow in Never Say Never Again. Mm -hmm. uh, and the current one is uh, is a man by the name of Christopher Waltz. Now these yes. the characters aren't as iconic, or the actors aren't as iconic as uh, as you know. Because I well maybe that's just me. Christoph Waltz is great though. Christoph Waltz I really he, like. Yeah, he's fantastic. I, I know them as the characters uh, when I go see the movie, but I would never you know recognize them. And that's not me. That's no judgment. That's just uh, mm -hmm. you know the other ones. You know, Honor well, Christoph Christoph is famous for uh, working with Tarantino. He was in Inglorious Bastards. He's the villain. And that's really what launched oh, his oh, pop him. culture stardom. That's Christoph. And then he's in Django. Okay. Oh, yeah, I know him. Yeah. He was like the head of the Nazis, wasn't he? Yes. In Glorious yeah. And that, that, okay. like, I think he, 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 he won mean, an he Oscar had a long for career. Yeah. He had a long career before that, but that launched him into like super world superstardom, I think, when he was in Inglorious Bastards. Because he was so okay. fantastic in it. Yeah. yeah he, I think he won the Oscar that year for that movie. Mm. Uh, yeah, he really yeah, he was great. And uh, Richard Keel. Who played Jaws? Another Detroit man. That's that's my uh, Detroit. Yeah, that's my favorite uh, Bond villain is Jaws. Yeah, because he was a villain, and you know he was a villain in two of the Roger Moore movies. He he was in two movies, so he recurred. Uh, and I just love the giant guy with the metal teeth. Like what a badass villain that is. Yeah, he was yeah. seven foot two, and reportedly suffered from a fear of heights. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, that's. I mean, he's seven foot two. He's two, like three hundred pounds or something like that. And not not when you fall, out it's of a proportion. Big deal. 
<laughs> yeah, not out of proportion. He had a car accident, and he and that's he walked with a cane for the rest of his life, mm-hmm. and uh, and he was in the most probably one of the most famous uh, Twilight Zone episodes, you know, to uh, to serve man, where uh, you know the, they land on this planet or whatever the Martians. Uh, you know, ended up, I, I spoiler alert, you know, the, the, to serve man was actually, you know, a cookbook. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and that's what he would sign. I had him sign a book for me once and he wrote, it's a cookbook. But, uh, but he was, you know, he came up to me, I've got a picture of this. He came up to me and put his hands on my head, just like that. Just put his, I mean, it was like a basketball and, uh, and he just, he just unannounced just went and did that to me. And, and you're uh, a colossus. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. How tall are you, Scott? I'm six foot two. So yeah, he makes you. He, I remember. I think I've seen the photo. He made you look tiny. Yeah, I mean, he would. I mean, he was a super nice guy. But uh, uh, well, and, uh, you, yeah. you mentioned that he. You mentioned that he had been in a car wreck. Uh, and if you look, if he played the character Mr. Larson in Happy Gilmore. Remember, he's in the audience at the, mm-hmm, at, the mm-hmm. uh, he's, at the golf tournaments, and um, he's wearing a T-shirt and that, that says "Guns don't kill people, I kill people." <laughs> and that's great. What's interesting if you watch that movie, in every shot he's in, he's either has a cane or he's leaning on somebody for that okay. reason because he was on he was unsteady on his feet for the rest of his life after mm-hmm. that. Yeah, and he wasn't he wasn't like he wasn't disabled. You know, it was just a hormone thing. You know, he he was uh, perfectly able. You know, until that accident, and mm-hmm. uh, perfectly proportioned. Uh, so yeah, that was um, yeah. He was and a big have guy. You, have you heard about? I, I've read. I recently read, and I don't know if you can confirm this. He was originally cast as the Incredible Hulk. No, in I didn't know that. He got he wasn't the part. Built, in... You know, the Hulk had to be a muscle man. You know, he had to be. Right. His shirt came off, and Keo mm-hmm. wasn't that guy. But yeah, but he didn't yeah, seem yeah. like a big, strong, built guy. He was just very not a tall bodybuilder, and just a large person. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah, and he uh, and he just passed away. Uh, I think he, he was one of those people that had a double grave because he was so big. They had to buy a double grave. Oh, and make really? Some casket for him. Yeah, and he was also he was born again too. He he mm-hmm. he was saved after he became an alcoholic and he stopped drinking. He attributed it to uh, uh, his savior, and uh, and he actually died in September of 2014 of a heart attack and uh yes i forget how old he was he was 70 he was, 70, he was 74 74 so just a couple yeah. of weeks or a couple of days before his 75th birthday i think yeah so uh, and other other villains were uh you know there was there was goldfinger there was literally mm-hmm. goldfinger who was the guy who played the king in chitty chitty bang bang oh interesting and, uh, and i think they dubbed his voice through the whole through the through the film because he could not speak english very well his real name is gert frobe uh was his name and he died in uh, september of 1988 of 75 of a heart attack yeah so there was odd job who was played by um an actor named harold sakata uh in goldfinger and he was a uh, a wrestler and a i believe a silver medalist uh, olympic weightlifter uh, he mm-hmm. was from Honolulu, Hawaii, and he he was of you know Japanese descent and lived and lived and died in in Hawaii. Uh, he was also in an episode of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> he was uh, uh, one of Rory, Rory Calhoun's henchmen, supposedly okay. on Gilligan's Island. Yeah, he was. Now he's a guy that took his role and went with it. Yeah, because that's <laughs> lar- that's that has been spooked because he had the bowler hat that was lined uh-huh. in lead or whatever it was, and he, he razor would, blades or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he would kill people with it. And then in the '60s, again, this is a, a reference, a, t- a time uh, reference. There was a cough medicine called Formula Forty Four, and mm-hmm. he was the he would cough, and every time he'd cough, it'd be like a karate chop, like some things <laughs> would get destroyed all around him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and, and, you know, so it was an iconic character, the, the Asian guy with the hat and uh, as right. the villain. And in uh, we're going to probably talk about this a little bit later. The Austin Powers movie. There was another actor named uh, his name was Joe Sun. And Joe Sun was a uh, was Korean and also a wrestler. And Joe Sun is in prison now for murder. He killed somebody. He actually he was he he participated and was found guilty in a gang rape, and then in prison oh. he killed a cellmate and got twenty seven years for it. That's who wait who was this again? I His remember name was Joe Sun. Joe yeah, Sun. Yeah, like years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, apparently the women the woman that they they had their way with said it's he said uh, it's Christmas and this is your lucky day, and uh, and and 
tortured her, and uh, and he was actually in prison. I guess the statute, sorry, I guess the statute of limitations for rape was over with, but they got him on torture, and mm. uh, and then uh, while in prison, he was he was put in with a sexual abuser in prison, and he killed a cellmate. Got another twenty seven years for that. So yeah. uh, so the guy that's in the Austin Powers movie is uh, <laughs> the first one, uh, man of international man of mystery, uh, portraying. Uh, the odd job, uh, uh, Harold parody Scott. character, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Hervé Billichet played a, a, a played a, with Roger Moore. Uh, Nick Nack was the character he played, and right. uh, another 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 villain. And uh, Roger Moore hated his guts. Actually, hated Hervé Billichet's guts. Said he was. Did, are there people that worked with Hervé that liked him? Well, it's true. He said he was a sex maniac. He he said, and he <laughs> and that's well documented too. And uh, and he he said that Roger Moore he was just so annoyed with him that Roger Moore goes how many how many women were you with since we started this movie and he said thirty five and uh, <laughs> and that's 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 including the ones he paid for I guess that's what he said that's that's the quote from Roger wow. Moore so uh, 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 so real quick odd job Harold Sakata died in uh, July twenty ninth nineteen eighty two from liver cancer he was sixty two years old sixty two so. in Hawaii mm -hmm. God bless him so and Herve uh, well documented committed suicide. Uh, tape recorded it, and I think we yeah. talked about this in a previous yeah, we episode. we talked about him early. Back to the Honor Blackman. So she famously played Pussy Galore in Goldfinger. <laughs> mm-hmm. And insert, <laughs> insert joke here. Uh, was actually, they say, based on a real model from Romania uh, named Livia Nasta. And she served in the Royal Air Force during World War II and had that nickname for some reason. Uh, this is what uh, this is the information I've gleaned, and she joined special operations dealing with Nazi control in in World War II, and she married a spy, and uh, and her husband was close to Winston Churchill, who knew Ian Fleming, and uh, so they oh. say that you know Pussy Galore was it sounds outrageous to say that was her her nickname, and they took it for, but that would explain the really graphic, you know, uh, it's a graphic <laughs> name. For you know, a movie in the '60s, how they got away with that through the censors? I, I, just I honestly don't know. think that back. I think that back then it was probably still more commonly a term for cat, and it was so it was just seen as a more harmless name than we probably see so. it as now. Especially was, by, probably by the in time, England, in England time, especially, I bet. Yeah, but not octopusy. Right. You know, by that time, by that time, yeah. it was like, come on, and they, maybe they got away with it because they said, oh, it's already an established character. You know, maybe that's how they got away with it. But uh, uh, I, I just find that fascinating. Miss yeah. um, Money Penny uh, it was mm -hmm. another uh, standard character, and it was originally played by Lois Maxwell, uh, who died in uh, 2007 at the age of 80. And then uh, Carolyn Bliss was uh, played Miss Money Penny in the Timothy Dalton one, and the Samantha Bomb Bond Samantha Bond, who actually. I know her more so from uh, Downton Abbey, and she played uh, 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 Crawley's uh, sister, and then Wait, uh, Naomi Harris. Yeah, yeah, the, the Crawley, the the head of the family, the patriarch. Uh, yeah, that's his sister. Plays uh -huh. uh, played her, and she is the one who, not Lady Mary. Who's the second one? The the fair haired one. I can't um, remember. She when she gets pregnant. What are you talking about? She goes to this one as her aunt. This is kind of cool. The character Q, who's been played by a lot of different people over the years, was actually based on a man that uh, Ian Fleming uh, served time, uh, served in the military, <laughs> <laughs> served in the military with Charles Fraser Smith. He uh, worked alongside Ian Fleming in WW2. And mm -hmm. he he invented things like flexible metal straws and and uh, and hidden compasses and golf balls and uh, that were sent to prisoners uh, in Germany <laughs> and uh, and so Ian Fleming took that sort of his knowledge of him and uh, and uh, incorporated it into the James Bond uh, novels that he he eventually turned into these films. But as I understand it, the MI six they would consult. Uh, uh, with uh, each other just to make sure the guys from Bond would invent something crazy like, you know, I don't know what it was, uh, but, you know, just guns and cufflinks and things like that. Uh, incorporate those, but they, they 
they kind of get in touch with the MI6 people and saying, what do you think of this? And they're saying, well, perhaps you might, you know, do something else or whatever. But but it was so legitimate because it's actually based on someone that Fleming uh, served in the military with. And they just wanted to check with MI6 to make sure, hey, we're not getting too close to real life. We don't want to right. give away anything that you're really doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I think the, I think that the, the, the compasses and, and hidden maps and hairbrushes and things like that, I think those were legitimately used. Wow. Uh, and, and, and were probably incorporated into the Bond films, but he invented them in real life. So it's kind of, kind of cool. And I, and I do remember uh, my grandfather was a POW at Stalagluf three during World War II. Mm -hmm. And I do recall um, re in researching that, that, yeah, they would sometimes get, in care packages, like a, 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 a some dice would actually be something you could be opened up, and there'd be something in it, a mm -hmm. message to the prisoners there, you know, for, from intelligence. So yeah, yeah, there was he there was one where he would uh, write in a special kind of ink that wouldn't be visible to anyone unless you urinated on it. That would make <laughs> it appear. So it was like you know, secret uh -huh. secret decoder rings, kind of things like that. Right. So um, yeah, yeah, fascinating man. Um, now here's a bit of trivia for you, and and in the movie. Uh, uh, License to Kill. Uh, the movie License to Kill came out in 1989, and that movie was used as the alibi for the Menendez murders. The boys oh. claim the boys claim they went to see License to Kill the night their parents were killed, and then the police were following up with it. Detectives are like, "Okay, can we see the stubs from the movie?" Mm -hmm. And they went, "No, actually, we went to see Batman or something like that." But right. uh, uh, or we watched it on TV. I don't know what it was exactly, but but they did use License to Kill as an alibi the night they murdered their parents. Unbelievable! And that's Timothy Dalton, right? I think License. I think to so. Kill. Yeah, License yeah. to Kill. Yeah. Those were the Timothy Dalton ones were violent. I remember that. The the two I remember I there was the one where the guy's the guy's head explodes in the pressurized like vault with like really? the little porthole window and you see the guy's head go. Pfft. Yeah, it's really. Uh, I remember being as a kid being like shocked because the James Bond movies usually weren't like that. It was a little campier violence, I guess, or you know more fun to watch. Uh, the Timothy Dalton right. ones really felt like serious, like R rated. Gory things yeah exactly. exactly interesting interesting i don't i don't remember those movies i you know it's to say i experience <laughs> them and i walk away goldfinger right. is iconic but uh, the most of the others i, I kind of remember you know certain instances you know like roger moore on that uh the fin not funicular but was the thing that's hanging and the, when he's skiing up in the alps and you uh -huh. know i think that was richard keel was 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 one of those guys and yeah so um so did I you ever play scenes. the golden eye video game no not Golden a big gamer. Eye? You're not a big you, Golden Eye. It was. Um, I, I was in college when that came out, and that was that. Is, that is one of those like video games that really changed video games forever because mm -hmm. the first person shooter game, but it was really advanced graphics for its time. And the big thing was it had multiplayer on a version. You could be odd job in the multiplayer and run around and try to get each other. Uh, it oh, was really it would be four on a screen you know you you'd have yeah. four different screens up to four players and that 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 game totally changed it was one a rare instance where a game based on a movie was actually really really good and not just mm -hmm. a promotional thing yeah mm -hmm. it's a huge game in a view to a kill there was a character called mayday and she wasn't a bad person I mean, she was a baddie so calling her <laughs> a bond girl is is technically wrong but it was grace jones and uh, and there's there's great action scenes with Grace Jones, and she's so iconic. She's so you know the way she looks is so in incredibly iconic. Mm -hmm. I think, and uh, and I I got another Grace Jones story if you want it. I, I don't yes. think I, I told this one in the past, but um, these are all a lot of these boiled down to my time in England, and uh, you end up having drinks with Grace Jones, or we were supposed to have drinks with Grace Jones. And if you if Grace Jones says anything, it's on Grace time. You know what I mean? So we had mm -hmm. a, a, an appointment to see her at like 8 o'clock. 10 o'clock, 10.30, she finally shows up. And so we're already half tanked, you know. And <laughs> um, and she comes in. We're, we talk a lot of small talk. You know, I, I mentioned, I talked to her about Pee Wee's uh, Christmas special because, again, it's one of my favorite episodes uh, of television ever in history. And, uh, and, and she was going on about how that was a magical experience working on that show. And, and But anyway, so somehow it got to uh the the term hermaphrodite and uh <laughs> and uh and uh and, uh, and you know a hermaphrodite by definition is a person who was born with uh, born with both female and uh and male genitalia now there's a there's a really famous rumor about someone who's uh well known for being in horror movies being 
someone like that, uh, a hermaphrodite. Huh. And I mentioned that to her, and she said, well, people say that about me, too. And I said, well, there's usually no smoke without fire. I had had a, you know, and that's when she, she blew up. She said, bull fucking shit. And she got really pissed off at me before that, because, you know, she, she was just, we got her calmed down eventually, but she was really pissed off at me. That you would even that imply up, that but, that could be true. Yeah. Even jokingly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she has, she has, you know, she's traded on the sort of, uh, male, female, uh, gender, you know, uh, uh, in one of her songs, uh, she talks, you know, feeling like a woman, looking like a man, uh, you know. So mm -hmm. there's, there is a, uh, you know, that came from one of her songs. So, you know, but yeah, bull fucking shit. She was pissed, but we uh, ended up calming her down, and uh, <laughs> it was, it was an ugly time with Grace. <laughs> but anyway, and she played this character called May Day, and uh, and I think that's the last of my name dropping this episode. Uh, uh, but my favorite will always be one of my favorite celebrity stories is Roger Moore and the fart machine and the phony cappuccino. <laughs> Amazing. And then the, the character of M who, you know, Robert Brown, Ralph Fiennes, M Bernard Lee, and they're currently, uh, or most recently, I think Judy Dench played M in most of the movies. Oh, uh. In the more recent movies. That's right. Yeah, Judy that's Dench. correct. Yeah. And they've just, uh, they just recently reintroduced the money penny character. In the new movies as well, I you know when I was doing it, I thought, oh, wasn't Gwyneth Paltrow a Money Penny? But that's Iron Man, and she plays the Money Penny character. She's kind of uh, that already. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one other thing, we talked. You asked about the name of the villain uh, in Goldfinger. Is so is that it? Uh, you know what? That, there's so many flailing edges to this, but as far right. as you know, what I my research went. And, you know, my favorite characters and stories all all came out of this. So uh, so it's no long, you know, it's certainly by no means a complete James Bond, but it's the ones we like. Yes. Well, uh, thanks again, everybody, for uh, listening in. And, and for those of you um, watching on YouTube, because we're putting these episodes on YouTube now and we are we're staying socially distanced from each other, uh, doing these from our own home still. And uh, we're just going to keep doing that. It's actually kind of easy once we get over the technical aspect of it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but we're going to keep doing this and um, thank you everybody for, for continuing to listen to us and, um, and hit us up on Patreon. Should you feel uh, so uh, inclined and also check us out on Scott's YouTube page, his dearly departed tours, uh, YouTube. Dearly page. Departed. Has... It's uh, it's called dearly departed online. And okay. uh, you can find it that way on, on YouTube. Look up Dearly Departed Podcast. You'll find it on YouTube as well. And when you get there, there's a little button to subscribe, and you'll be notified of our future podcasts being launched. Yeah, and you have like 23,000 followers and growing, so that's really awesome. All right, so uh, everybody, thanks again for listening in, and we will see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks, you guys.